So in our second day, uh, Ernani is continuing with his lectures on uh, great and rich solitons. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Mustafa. Uh, so uh, let me uh, continue on the, the lecture. Today is the, the second lecture. So today I try to explain now uh, the connections of the rich soliton we have, the rich flow, and present some examples and basic properties that will be very interesting for us. So let me just recall that the, the last lecture, we showed that uh, if you start, if you have the rich flow, have here the rich flow, the initial metric is not. And uh, if you start the rich flow, we have uh, Einstein metric, this is my initial metric is Einstein. Uh, along of the flow, then the self-similar solutions obtained is given by uh, j i j t equals to one minus two o t uh, j i j not. So this is the solution of the rich flow, the self-similar solutions obtained by the rich flow when we start with a uh, Einstein metric, and essentially. When you see that what you do here is only a scaling of the metric, you are or shrink or expandly or maybe uh, stationary solution. Uh, this value here, we replace the, the geometry, which becomes more large or, or small, depends of the value of hope that you can be choose here, okay? Then this is the idea when you start with initial metric uh, Einstein, and uh, the idea is uh, shrink or, 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 or expanding the manifold homothetically. So, but how we can obtain a, a richer solution? The idea is to look for a solution of the richer flow, a little bit more general than this. For example, here, we are assuming scaling of the metric a family of one parent family of metrics obtained by scaling of the metric. But if you now consider a family of metrics solution of the rigid flow such that I have a scaling of the metric, but also uh, uh, one parent family of diffeomorphism that change this initial metric here. We start with the initial method not and do you take it for the, the modification of this metric along of the flow by a scaling of the metric and also a diffeomorphism? So this is what we call a self-similar solution. Self-similar solution of the rich flow. This is a self-similar solution of the rich flow. Uh, let me start with these equations, and I'm trying to show that we can obtain the, the rich solid equation uh, only doing a simple computation. For example, if let me, I, I'm, I'm, this guy is a scalar factory for each t that you choose will be a constant. Okay, this is a scalar factory. Uh, to this uh, equations and uh, make sense it's necessary to return to denote when you take t to be equals to zero. Then in this, in this point in t equals to zero, we obtain sigma zero, phi naught, star t naught. So in other words, to make sense here, we need to have sigma naught equals to one and phi and, and sigma and, and, and phi naught to be equals to the identity. This diffeomorphism must be the identity. Then it's, it's very important for us, this information, and to make sense, this self-similar solutions, we have this initial condition. So if you now compute the derivative of this guy, remember, it's differential geometry, all time you take the derivative. <laughs> then if you take the derivative of this guy, what you obtain is the derivative of the metric is, uh, let me put it, okay. Uh, sigma line T 
PT, the pullback of the initial metric plus uh, sigma T, uh, the derivative in relation to T of sigma T star T naught. Okay, so we know that this is a self similar solution of the Ricci flow. Then this guy here can be replaced to be twice the Ricci curvature with respect to the, the time t. So in other words, this I have this term equals to this, this, this side here. So if you're looking for this value in the initial metric in t equals to zero, we have a thing that is twice the Ricci curvature with, with respect to the initial metric is equals to sigma line zero phi naught star to naught plus sigma naught, the derivative in the time equals to zero of phi t star to naught. So this guy here, we may assume that uh, d naught is just to be more simple notation, not is equal to D, then this is minus two, the rich character with respect to D. This guy, I can keep it. This one, I know that sigma uh, phi, phi, phi naught is equal to the identity in the this time equals to zero. Then this becomes just D plus sigma zero, is equals to one, then this guy becomes one. Then I have just the derivative here and t goes to zero, sigma t, t. So, but this by the curse of uh, smooth manifold, we know that this is derivative. This guy here is the, the lead derivative of a vector field x, where x is, let me put, X is the vector field obtained by this, uh, is the vector field uh, generates by, um, just generates by phi t, okay? This one found the found of the film. Let's put like this, much in. In other words, uh, we have this, the Ricci curvature plus one half of the delivery, the lead derivative of the vector field X with respect to this term is equals to this. Then this guy here, we know that Sigma T is a scalar factor. Then I can call this guy to be lambda. Then we recover the Ricci solid equation. So in other words, if you have a self-similar solution of the Ricci flow, that which means that is uh, it's only changed by scaling and the diffeomorphism, then we obtain a Ricci soliton equation. The, the converse statement is, is also true. If you start a, a Ricci soliton, we start with a soliton, I can produce, I can obtain a, a, a self-similar solution of the Ricci flow. Just consider this, this, this family of vector fields, one minus two lambda t, and take it, the diffeomorphism to be a one parameter family obtained by uh, uh, one parent family of the theomorphism obtained by xt. And we have this notation is it's 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 not difficult to show that we have this self-similar solution. In other words, we are showing is that a self-similar solution is a rich soliton, is a rich soliton, is a self-similar solution of the rich flow. Uh, so this is one of the reasons to, 
try and understand the geometry of fluidity solid and they appear self similar solutions in the rigid flow. That is another motivation to consider the solid uh, inside of the rigid flow. I will not give you many details, but I try to just give a flavor of this, which is when you looking for singularity models. But before I do that, let me also uh, show that this, the value of lambda here, we know that uh, in the Einstein case, we will produce or shrink or expanding examples. And in the rich result is the same. If lambda is positive or lambda is negative, we also use this idea to call uh, the lambda positive to be a shrink rich solid on lambda negative to be a span rich solid on lambda zero to be a, a stat rich solid. It's the the motivation to this this name comes from this uh, uh, this approach. Okay, so another motivation to study rich solid is because they are model of singularities. of the rigid flow. We have no time to, to discuss this case more uh, specifically, but the idea is it's simple. If you consider DT to be a solution of the rigid flow on the maximal time, because we know that, for example, if you remember the example of the sphere, we know that the, we will develop a singularity in a finite time. Then suppose we have a solution of the rich flow that, that exists for a maximum time, uh, capital T, for example, capital T. Or what zero less than T is finite time, okay? And such that, the curvatures blows up in this time. The curvatures goes to infinity. The maximum of the curvature goes to infinity when uh, t go to this maximal time. It's something like the sphere. Okay. The idea is, for example, if you start with a manifold something like that, in if I call this to be the initial manifold, then we can continue the flow and continue a little bit more. However, along of this, we can develop here a singularity. If you take a zoom here, is something like we have something like cylinder, and if you continue the process, this cylinder goes to a line, and then the curvature will converge to will goes to infinity. This is what we call blow up of the curvature. Okay, so in this case, we said that the T develops. Uh, finite time singularity, okay? As t goes to this maximal time. So, and with this idea, Hamilton introduced what you call a type one singularity. The type one singularity is essentially to looking for this, the limit when t goes to infinity of t minus t, the maximal time t. If this value is, is finite, then we have this, uh, sorry, here is, When this limit is finite, then we said that solution, this singularity is type one. If 
If it is, is not is is equals to infinity, then the solution the solutions will be uh, the singularity will be type two. Uh, very recently, a result obtained by combining results by Cezo, Neighbor, Anders, Buzano, Topping, Shane, Wang, Zandi, Henry, Bunler, and Richard Bennett from uh, Berkeley, and many results uh, by combining them, we can uh, guarantee that the blows up, the blows up around a type one singularity. point of the rich flow converge to an untrivial gradient shrink rich solid. And this result obtained by them also show the connections in very, the, the importance of the, the, the rich soil to inside of the rich flow. So I'm not giving more detail, details about that. I'm, try, I'm now trying to explain how is the connection uh, of this with some examples. So, before I do that, I just call attention that this is shrink, gradient shrink with solutions become very special for this result. They are a uh, model of singularities of the rigid flow, at least in the type one uh, singularity model. Then is one of the reasons that you focus on shrink case in my next two lectures. Today, no. But in the next two lectures, uh, we'll uh, look more carefully for the shrink case. So uh, let me also give a remark here before to, to proceed that here we know that uh, to obtain a self-similar solution, it's necessary that the, 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 the vector field to be complete, okay? However, uh, what I'd like to say that is in a compact case, FM is compact. We know that the associate vector field is always complete. But if M is not compact, it's non-compact, uh, then the associate vector field may not be complete. This is in, in general. However, in general. However, uh, Zhang observed that observed that for any complete rich soliton, complete gradient rich soliton. The idea we have potential function f the associate vector field is a complete vector field. In other words, Every complete gradient rich salt, in fact, produce a self-similar solution in general. 
this does not depend of the, the completeness of the, this guy because the completeness can be obtained. So let me now proceed in, to discuss examples. Uh, example is, is crucial. Greater solidness. Just to keep attention, let me remember the, the definition. I will put the definition of the gradient rich solitons that are more interested right now. So the first example is a, we call a trivial one. Trivial because it's the following if you take the sphere, if in the round metric, and uh, what we know about this guy is that. The Ricci curvature is proportional to the metric by a constant n minus one d, or n is the dimension of such manifold. Then when looking for the fundamental equation here, a Ricci soliton, we know that we have this side here n minus d plus Hessian f equals to lambda g. If you assume that this equation holds, suppose suppose that this equation holds. So if you send this guy for another side. We obtain the Hessian F equals to lambda minus n minus one d here. If you take the trace, we obtain the Laplacian F is equal to lambda minus n minus one times lambda. What you know of this side is that this guy is constant. If this guy is constant, it's bigger than equals to zero, less than equals to zero. And in any case, we can use the Massimo principle or the Hopf lemma because the sphere is compact to conclude that F must be constant. But if F is constant, it's the case that you call a trivial example because the, 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 the potential function is constant. I'm, we are looking for the, the richest solid equation as a, a, a PDE, then we are looking for solutions. I'm looking for potential function non-trivial that satisfies this equation. So this is the first example, but it's not too good because it's the trivial one. In the sense that the, 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 the potential function is constant. Okay. So uh, here I consider this sphere because we will see later that the rich solid must uh, at least in the in the shrink in the shrink and in that case, must has a non-negative scalar curvature. I will give more details later. But the round sphere is our first example. However, it's trivial. Uh, the triviality comes from the Einstein equation. How? But it's natural to ask if that is a non-trivial example. Uh, our first non-trivial example is obtained by in the Euclidean space. However, we know that the Euclidean space is rich flat. The Euclidean space with standard metric, you know that the rich curvature is zero, it's rich flat. But when you're looking for, for the fundamental equation, what you know that is this term disappear because the, 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 the rich curvature vanishes. But if F is constant in the previous example, we know that it must be trivial. However, in, the, in this case, it is possible to obtain a non-trivial functions. Although this is Einstein, we know that this potential function here is, sorry, this potential function here is a non-trivial. Solution to this part of the equation. Okay. In other words, I can put here F to be lambda divided by two, the norm of the x square. And then this is a non trivial example because lambda, uh, sorry, F is not constant. However, we have an Einstein example again. Okay, 
So this is called Gaussian soliton. Gaussian soliton, and it was obtained by Hamilton. And this is to be important for us. In, when I will discuss uh, some results and compare with this example later. But from this example, it is natural to ask if possible to obtain a non-Einstein example because this first one is Einstein, the second one is also Einstein as well. The first one, the potential function is trivial. The second one, the potential function is not trivial. But we know that which is also a natural generalization of the Einstein equation. So it's natural to ask about uh, non-Einstein examples. Let me show one. Uh, we can take a generalized cylinder with a standard metric. This is the cylinder soliton. And the potential uh, with standard metric, the standard metric, and the potential function is, uh, is just taking a, a guide to depends on, on it by t. I, I don't remember this exactly, but it's something like this. Just depends of this Euclidean factor, okay? Another example that you can put in here is the Siga soliton. Siga soliton, because the geometry looks like a, a Siga. And this is the Euclidean space. However, we change the metric, not the standard metric. Is a Siga metric. And you look uh, for the poten potential function to be minus the logarithm of one plus square times square. This is also a non Einstein example and non trivial, uh, like the third one, like the fourth. Then we have four examples here. I believe that we can feel comfortable to continue. I will show many other examples during this mini course, but with this four example is, I think is enough at this time. Okay, the the result that we discuss in the in the the rest of the, the this lecture of today, uh, it's possible to compare with this this example. Okay, so what can you say about uh, the properties of the rich solitons. We know that there are examples, Einstein examples, there are examples, no Einstein. Then what can you say about the geometry of the, the rich solitons? Let me show some basic properties. Of gradient. Okay, to do that, let me again consider here a gradient rich soliton. Okay, satisfying the, the fundamental equation of rich plus hash and f equals to lambda d. It's very common if you looking for a specific case, for example, shrink case. We only put here one half, or if you're looking for the span case, you put here minus one half. Okay, I now I'm now consider uh, all case span instead and shrink. Then I put lambda, and later I will take the particular case when lambda equals one half and minus one half, and uh, and, and and so on. Okay. <laughs> This lemma was proved by Hamilton. There are some uh, and some uh, alternative uh, proofs by these formulas, but essentially was initially proved by Hamilton. 
the first equation is with uh, if you have a gradient shrink ridge solitum, then the scalar curvature plus the Laplacian of the potential function is proportional to lambda n. The second one is, is that if you take the derivative of the scalar curvature, this is given is exactly twice the read apply uh, uh, the gradient of the potential function. The third one is that the scalar curvature plus nabla f square is equals to lambda f plus a constant c. C here is a, is a constant. So in the third, the, the fourth one is the Laplacian of the scalar curvature. It is equals to the gradient of nabla f plus two lambda r minus twice the norm of the rich square. So let me give some uh, remark here. Look at that. The first one, it's very easy to prove because the first one is just taking the tracing. If you trace this, the rich curvature, you obtain the scalar curvature, the trace of Haitian is the Laplacian, the trace of the metric is the dimension. Okay, the first one is, is simple, is okay. About the second one, this expression here, this means that if you have the gradient of nabla uh, of the scalar curvature is twice the reach applied to nabla f. We know that the reach is, uh, was defined here in this liquidity as a two tensor, but when you write like this, we are looking for one one tensor. What means that the, the gradient uh, with some vector field y is twice reach nabla f y for any y in the tangent space, okay? This is what this means, okay? This is equivalent to looking for a two tensor or one one tensor depends of, of your uh, interest, okay? Uh, the third equation is also very useful in this equation is, uh, in the case, for example, if lambda is one half in the shrink case, we can we can take a scaling of the metric and consider this to be uh, sorry scaling of the metric and scaling of the uh, we can multiply uh, we can normalize the potential function f to be to satisfy these equations. This is up to normalizing of f. If you take a normalization of f, if you look for f plus a constant, then I, I, I replace f to be f plus such a constant. And this equation is knowing um, Hamilton's becomes famous as Hamilton equation for the rich soil. This is Usually when it, the people says, uh, look at for the, the Hamilton equation, is this one, okay? The four equations is also very interesting because this guy here can be just to write like this, the Laplacian F, the drift Laplacian, and you, we have two lambda scalar curvature minus two, the norm of which is square. Uh, and this, when, for example, if lambda, if lambda is zero, we can see that this guy has a sign. In particular, if, for example, in the stat case, when lambda is zero, if this scalar curvature is constant, this term disappear, then a rich, this rich salt must be rich flat. But this, these equations are, uh, very interesting and powerful. There are another important equations. I will show another important equations. But interesting that we can combine and obtain some uh, interesting properties for, for rich solitudes. Just using them. Okay. So let me 
give an idea of the proof. The first one, it's okay. It's just take the trace. The second one, the, the assertion is that the twice of nabla f, the, 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 the scalar curvature is, is dual, the, the gradient of the scalar curvature is twice reach applied to nabla f. Observe that if the scalar curvature is constant, this equation also says that the nabla f, the gradient of the potential function, is the eigenvector of the reach curvature. If the scalar curvature, if you have a rich soliton with constant scalar curvature, then this implies that the nabla f, the gradient of the potential function, is an eigenvector of the rich curvature. So, how we can prove this? To prove this, it's only necessary to start with the, the twice constructed second beyond identity. Remember that I proved this, this formula here. Uh, Nabla RF is the divergence of the Ricci curvature. We proved this uh, in the last lecture. This term can be write as JK Nabla K R I T. Okay, so this was proved in the last lecture. is a consequence of the second behind identity. It's only necessary to take the, the trace uh, twice. Then when you use the fundamental equation here, because the fundamental equation is rich plus Hessian F equals to lambda D, I can write this in coordinates like this. And using this equation here, what you obtain is JK is nabla K, and here we obtain lambda JIJ minus nabla i nabla j f. And then when you, you send the derivative for each term here, we obtain nabla k lambda j i j plus lambda nabla k j i j minus nabla k nabla i nabla j f. This term is zero because lambda is a constant this term is zero because the metric is parallel. Then we also, we just obtain that JK is minus nabla K, nabla I, nabla JF. It's a, it's a, it's a very famous truck, truck in geometry. If you don't know what you do, you take the derivative. If you already take the derivative, take the second derivative. <laughs> if you have more than, Two derivatives try to replace this position. It's a truck in geometry. Then here we have three derivatives. What you try to do is looking for change the derivative, change the position. Okay. When you do that, what you obtain is uh, j k minus. If you change the position here. We need to, uh, let me put this minus in. Let's put this minus outside. When you do that, you need to compensate here by put the, the curvature, okay? This is the, ident the, the rich identity, and this is a general uh, 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 version of the rich identity. So when you do that, if you replace these indices in the second and the third derivative, we need to compensate this with the term of the curvature. So when you do that, and now, and you send the metric again for each term, it becomes minus. This first one, I can put the metric inside here because this first derivative does not depend of j and k. When you do that, we obtain here minus the derivative of trace of the Haitian because j and k exactly the same indices here. 
by the trace of the Haitian de la Plage. Okay. Here's the same argument, but is the trace of the Riemann. Looking for the position is first and the third position. It's okay. We need to take the, the positions second and fourth. Then if you replace twice, you the sign will be the same. So this provides that R, I, S, number S, F. At the same time, we know from the first uh, item here that the Laplacian F, F is equal to lambda N minus R. Then if you put it here, this is lambda N minus R minus R S number S F. So this is derivative is zero. I have just the derivative of the scalar curvature minus R S. R S not less F. So remember, we are beginning with one half of the derivative of the scalar curvature. In other words, what we have is one half nabla R equals to nabla R minus R S nabla S F. If you send this guy to here, this guy to there, then we obtain the, the derivative of the scalar curvature is twice the rich curvature applied to number. Okay. Uh, this is the idea to uh, uh, play with these indices. It's not too. It's not too difficult. Uh, it's just to training this, but I like to do this computation just to see the flavor of of the of the computation. So the the third one is known as Hamilton's equation, and this is very important as well. And the idea of the proof is easy. It's just we would like to show that this equation holds. And constant. And the idea is simple, is just take the derivative of this equation and try to show that this derivative is zero. Then you conclude that uh, this function must be constant in a in the connect uh, uh, connect manifold. So this derivative becomes the gradient of nab, nab, the, the, the gradient of the scalar curvature. And this becomes this, and this becomes two lambda nabla f. So at the same time, you know, for the first, the second uh, equation here, we can replace the gradient of the scalar curvature to be twice reach apply nabla f plus this guy here is the same to write uh, twice Haitian f applied to nabla f minus two lambda nabla f. If you put to here in evidence and keep just the equation and put nabla f outside as well. Here is the rich solitary equation that's become is equals to zero. Then it's zero and the, the result is proved. The last one, which is, uh, the Laplacian of the scalar curvature equals to nabla r, nabla f. Maybe this we have time. I you I you also give an idea how we can prove this more quickly. Then, uh, then we can see in in some books. So. It's only necessary to look for the divergence of the gradient of the scalar curvature to obtain the Laplacian of the scalar curvature. Okay, let me change the position. So the Laplacian of the scalar curvature is equal to the divergence of the, the gradient of the scalar curvature. But this guy, I can write like this. Uh, I can put, uh, the divergence 
of the scalar curvature. We know by the, by the second second expression is twice the rich apply. This is twice rich apply. apply F. So let me write this in coordinates. In coordinates, let me put twice outside. This is the divergence. This symbol is this divergence. And the rich inside is IJ and Nabla uh, IF. This is what is uh, right above here. So now I need to take the derivative here of this term. Then let me do that. Sorry, let me put like this. The two J I K Nabla K, and the derivative becomes I J Nabla F plus twice J K. The rich curvature Nabla K Nabla I F. So this one, when you looking for the trace of the derivative with respect to K I J. We know by the second, the, the twice contracts second being the identity, this is one half of the derivative of this scalar curvature. And here I can use the fundamental equation of the rich soliton here in coordinates to write to lambda k k i minus. Uh, R K I. So here I cancel the two above and, and, and behind, and then I have here the same inch, the same inch here, I I becomes the gradient with the scalar character with the gradient of the potential function F. And here uh, I can uh, Looking for each one separately. The first one is JK RJ lambda K chi A minus twice JK RJ I chi A. So look at JK JK, same means is the trace. Then this guy here, the last one becomes. Minus twice the norm of the rich square. <laughs> That's very nice. This. And this one, what we have here is, is interesting as well because I have two lambda. And when we are looking for this guy here with this, we obtain delta uh, ij. But delta ij becomes that here, this the, the inch must be the inch j must be i as well. Then I have the indices here, r, i, i, is a trace of the, the rich curvature. But the trace of the rich curvature is the scalar curvature. Then we conclude with the proof. It's just uh, to give an idea how can you use these indices. Process. All details. But this is how I do. Okay. So turn to uh, the first one is this one. Is uh, the Laplacian number R double F minus plus two lambda R minus twice the norm of the rich curvature square. So if you look at these equations in particular case, for example, if you look in uh, when lambda is equals to one half, which means that shrink case. Uh, the, the, the third equation becomes R plus the gradient of a square equals to uh, F plus a constant. If you uh, 
replace the potential function f by another one if you take him for f plus a constant a uh, normalization of f we can assume uh, without laws of generality that this equation holds to have to normalize it's common to looking for this equation in particular we can see here one important information that the scalar curvature becomes less than equals to the potential function. Then the behavior of the potential function, the behavior of potential function uh, gives a gives information on a scalar curvature. Okay. It's very important to just uh, if you if you know how is the behavior of the potential function, at least above, we can compare this behavior with the, the scalar curvature. Another important information I'd like to say here is that all example that I discussed in the shrink case, the first example, the second example, the third example here, First one is sphere, it's a trivial one, the Gaussian soliton and the cylinder, they have constant scalar curvature. Okay. So uh, here I have a question is about uh, non constant scalar curvature examples. I will show some uh, answer uh, later. But now I think you need to keep in mind that the scalar curvature in the shrink case is always controlled by the potential function, at least above. Okay, this will be important for us. If you have the case of lambda zero, I have also a, a good information if lambda is equal to zero. The third equation, this is the case of steady rich soliton. The third equation becomes just scalar curvature plus the Laplacian, the, the gradient of norm square in that constant C. This constant C is the, it can be uh, fixed, but you know this constant must be uh, positive, in fact, no negative, uh, because there is a, a result that you discuss later that guarantee that every shrink and steric solid must uh, have no negative must has no negative scalar curvature. Okay, so but I'd like to just call attention that these four equations seems simple, but they are very useful to obtain some basic uh, information about uh, rich solids. Okay. The four, the four equation also gives the important information when you're looking for the case of lambda equals to one half, the shrink case. The information is, if you assume, for example, here I have just two uh, lambda, I just, it becomes this again. This becomes the scalar curvature minus twice the rate square. For example, if you assume the scalar curvature is constant, it holds, for example, the Gaussian soliton, the cylinder soliton, these two terms disappear. In other words, the scalar curvature as you divide by two is equal to the norm of this scalar curvature, the rich curvature square. Remember that if you're looking for the, the rich curvature, uh, uh, I can uh, use some eigenvalues to represent the matrix of the, the rich curvature because it's symmetric, then it's diagonalized. And this equation says that if you take the trace of this eigenvalue, because the scalar curvature is the trace of this guy, this trace is equals to the sum of the square. Sorry, here is n. 
And depending of the dimension, this number of eigenvalue bus to be less or, or bigger than uh, two or three bus to be higher or, or lower. So, and then there's a very useful equation when you like to show some rigid results, we can use this uh, properly to prove interesting results. So just to give an idea how these equations are important. So let me continue. And now I will focus on the, on the compact case. What do you know in a compact case? So there are many important uh, results in compact case, and there are many open problems in compact case. Sometimes the people, uh, we know that there are some uh, very important results and also uh, are uh, important open problems. So for example, just to give you an idea, the, the theory is Hamilton, a result obtained by Hamilton and also combined by a result by IV, we know that if you have a gradient instead or, or is Compact to solid, they are necessarily the metric. If this is or we can we can go more with this information because uh, if you start with a rigid soliton with lambda less than equals to zero, they start and spend the case. The result says the 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 metric must be Einstein. In other words, the rigid curvature becomes proportional to the metric. Then we have this equation. If you send this term for another side, we obtain this. And if you take the trace, we obtain any lambda minus Rn. So if the dimension is bigger than it goes to three, we know the Einstein metric has constant scalar curvature. Then if the dimension is bigger than it goes to three, this term in this uh, right side is constant. And we can use the Hopf lemma, Massimo principle, to conclude that this imply f must be constant. In other words, the result obtained by Hamilton and IV shows that if you have a steady spanning in compact gradient which is soliton, then it must be trivial. The potential function f must be constant. Okay. So that is also a very beautiful result. The proof is very clever by Perlman. He proved that any compact rich soliton is necessarily a gradient rich soliton. Now let's uh, let's look more more carefully this result. Perman proved that if you have a compact with a soliton, then it must be a gradient one. At the same time, looking for this example for Hamilton obtained by Hamilton IV, he proved that if you have a gradient steady span compact with salt, it must be a trivial one. Then these two results combine 
implies that if you have a non trivial, non trivial, compact rich solvent. must be a shrinky one, must be shrink. Lambda must be positive. Then when you looking for compact case, if you have talking about compact with salt, we just consider shrink because the steady span must be trivial. Okay, then compact, you shrink. It's okay. Any question? No. So let me give some uh, remarks about this theory by Perman because it is a little bit uh, confused when you're looking for the, 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 the statement. Because he says that any compact rich solvent is necessarily a gradient rich solvent. But how we can do that? The idea is not too hard. The idea is if you start with a rich solvent, a compact one, then we have here rich plus one half, the D derivative equals to lambda D. What he did, he proved that we always can replace this vector field x by a gradient one. We can do that this equation. Lambda is the same. Lambda is the same. The manifold, of course, is the same. And the metric is the same. What you do here is replace this vector field. Well, natural question is how, how is this, this, this replacement? How is, how is the relations between X and the nabla of this potential function F? So the connection between them is that X is equal to F plus R. They are equals up to a killing vector. Just to recall, a killing vector is a, a vector field set that the relative is respect. So then, what we have right now, we know that a compact with salt. Uh, in summary, we have here two information. The first one is that a rich salt must be, if you have a, if you have a rich salt, a compact with solid. The first thing that I know that is lambda must be positive. It must be shrink. Now let me put in the, in the order. It must be gradient is the first. The second one is to must be shrink. What can say more about the rich salt in, the, in a compact case? So let me just separate here. Let me post it here. I will return for all this here, but what we know more. So another important contribution of Hamilton in this theory
also combined with the result by AV is that in dimension n is less than equals to three, that is dimension two and dimension three, there are no compact shrink which is solid. But of course, other than those of constant positive curvature. That is the trivial ones. For example, the sphere, uh, the, the sphere is Einstein, then it's compact becomes trivial. Here we are saying that there is no example in dimension two and three, uh, uh, non-trivial. Then you can return for our list and you can say that dimension must be bigger than or equals to four. Uh, or maybe not, because before to guarantee that, we need to show th that there is a compact example, a non-trivial in dimension four, okay? But we know that at least this can be happening because in dimension two and three, they are trivial. It's clear. Then, uh, in other words, don't make sense to look and for the rich historical theory in compact case in dimension two and three, because they must be uh, trivial. Another important uh, information is this was proved by Wiley, but also by Garcia, you, and the Fernandes Lopes. From William Wyden, I Fernandez Lopez. I see a here with Fernandez Lopez from Spain, while in the United States. And we can guarantee that we have a gradient, uh, a compact rich solid, and then the first fundamental group was to be finite. Then we have another information to put here is that a compact with salt, the first fundamental group must be finite. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking about the examples in dimension bigger than equals to four to remove this, this question here. And let me answer now. The first example of compact Gradient which is solid on dimension four was obtained by Haidon Sao and Koizu around nine And this example is essentially the complex projective plane with a connex sum of minus the complex predictive plane. We have uh, tangent orientation here. The minus here is just tangent orientation. This is a non-trivial example. How you discuss this example in the, in the next lecture more carefully, but this is a non-trivial one. And this has dimension, real dimension four. Then we can guarantee with this example that, in fact, I have here uh, in compact case, the rich salt must be gradient, shrink, the dimension bit must be bigger than equals to four, and the first fundamental group must be, must be finite. It's okay. So, another result that I'd like to show is uh, was proved by 
this uh, movie here. It's organized here. Another result they like to show it's more general, but before I do that, let me uh, put in this. This is a result by Bill Longsheng, which says that this is exactly not the the statement because the statement is a little bit more general. But let me put in this version, and later I will discuss uh, the general version. This version is if you have a, a gradient shrink with a soliton, and he proved that the scalar curvature must be no negative. Okay. In fact, he proved also this result for a. Uh, uh, for a state case. Stat case, the same result holds. In other words, the scalar capital must be non-negative. However, there is a, also a beautiful result obtained by the Italian mathematicians, uh, Pigola, Emote, and said, which guarantee that if there exists a point P, on a such rich cycle, such that the scalar curvature is zero, then it must be rich flat. And when you have a rich flat example of gradient shrinking soliton, there is only one possibility it must be the Gaussian solid. In other words, it must be the Gaussian solid that you discuss today. So, in certain sense, we are talking about a gradient shrink rich soliton. We can say that the scalar curvature is totally positive uh, instead of it's not the Gaussian solid. If you remove the Gaussian solid of the list, the scalar curvature must be strictly positive. This is a result by Belong Shen combined with Pigula, He mode, and set results. So, uh, now, if you return for how you can put with a uh, uh, one thing more, that the scalar curvature becomes strictly positive. So this is general, not the compact case it is true in compact and non-compact case. The result proved by belong chain is it's general. Okay, so. If you return for the second, the third equation proving in our lecture today, in the shrink case, we assume that we have this equation up to normalizing the potential function f. So with this, and with the information of the scalar curvature is strictly positive, we can guarantee that zero is strictly, we have this one F, okay? In other words, the result says that the potential function of a rich salt is also non-negative. And we have an important information for a rich salt theory. Of course, here is normalized. We can take a normalizing like this. And with this normalization, the potential function is also non-negative as well. Okay? So I need to stop here. Uh, I, I continue in the next lecture, we will discuss some uh, examples in the Kelly case because this example appear here, I will discuss this example more properly, and I will go to the non-compact rich solitons with more details, okay? And tomorrow I will also discuss some open problems in compact case that we have no uh, time to, to discuss here because I need to show the motivations 
to to this this open problem. So this thank you. Welcome. Any question? Mm, let me ask you something. Uh, it is uh, metric on the blow up of CP two. Is the Einstein metric or no? Uh, it's it's this not, is not Einstein. Einstein. Okay. This is not Einstein. This is not Einstein, which is solid on. Mm -hmm. This guy is not Einstein. In fact, right. uh, uh, there is a, another version of this uh, this 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 example. Um, this is the first example obtained by Haidon Sal and Coiso, and uh, Wang obtained later another example, which is essentially a blow up in two points. Let's take oh. this example. Another example proved by obtained by Wang uh, using a different technique, but this an example. This is not Einstein. Remember that if, if Einstein, the scalar curvature must be must be constant. This is an example we have non constant scalar curvature. Oh. So and this also is not Einstein as well. And uh, in particular, we have here open problem because the two examples are the only known examples in compact case. They are Keller. They are Keller examples, Keller manifolds. And uh, the first open problem that, that I can mention here is if there is a known Keller example in compact case, there's an open problem. I see. We don't, we don't know. Uh, uh, non Keller example of compact rich solid in dimension four. For example, we can start in dimension four because in dimension two and three, we know that there is no example. This guarantee that the dimension must be the, the interest in dimension four start here is why the reason of the, the lectury uh, is for dimension of rich solid because in dimension two and three, there is no reason to look in that. So these two examples are Kelly. They are the only examples known in dimension four in compact case, of course, in compact case. And one question is about the uniqueness of the example or about the existence of a new example known Kelly. Okay. If you assume Kelly, if you take a compact result in Kelly, uh, it's no the uniqueness it must be one of these to example is a result that follows by a paper of Gantian. But when an open question is about a non kel example, this is, yeah. All right, that's an interesting question. Yeah, okay, let's think about it, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question? All right.